Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Kofal. I'm a staff lawyer at East Coast Environmental Law. Um, and I think everyone here, hopefully everyone here, is joining me today for our Environmental Impact Assessment Law webinar. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement today. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that the place where I am today, Winnemaki, is within the traditional unceded and unsurrendered uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq. And we have folks joining us from all around New Brunswick. And depending on where you live and are located, uh, you could be working and living within the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq, the Peskotamakati, and the Wolastuk. Um, all of these territories are covered by treaties of peace and friendship that were entered into with the British beginning in the early 18th century. Um, I'd also like to highlight and acknowledge that the laws that I'm going to be talking about today are colonial settler laws um, and that we should be mindful that we're all treaty people and that these laws that I'll be talking about are actually not only are not the only laws and are not the first laws of the land and that we should uh, make sure that we can provide space and room for the, the other um, the indigenous peoples living here and their laws and customs. Uh, so just a quick bit about us. Uh, East Coast Environmental Law uh, is a public interest organization that's based in um, uh, Halifax and we work on issues of concern um, uh, to all of Atlantic Canadians. And our work is really centered around ensuring that laws are responsible, transparent, and inclusive. Um, and our objective is to encourage the development and fair application of innovative and effective environmental laws through kind of our three pillars, which are education, collaboration, and legal action. And some of the things we do include hosting a free um, inquiry service on our website, we work with organizations, communities, individuals throughout the Atlantic region <clears throat> to do environmental legal research and provide information. And we do things like this webinar, which is intended to provide uh, information about environmental laws to the public. <clears throat> so quickly, an agenda for today. I'm gonna to be talking for about 45 minutes uh, about federal impact assessment uh, and provincial environmental impact assessment. And really my intention uh, is to provide and highlight uh, some of the public participation opportunities that are available through those two processes. Uh, then we'll have three, actually we'll have four guest speakers doing three presentations, about 15 minutes each. And the topics will include uh, assessment of New Brunswick EIA and potential reform, uh, current work going on right now at the Environmental Impact Assessment Branch uh, and strategic and regional assessments. And then hopefully we'll have about half an hour for questions and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. You can, you can pose your questions in the chat uh, and I'll have our, my article and clerk, Dan, kind of keep track of those. Uh, the questions that we're not able to get to today, we'll keep track of and we'll try to answer as best as we can in our follow-up report. So let's get right to it then. Uh, so starting off, what is environmental impact assessment? So basically EIA as it's referred to commonly is a planning process that's used to identify, consider, assess the various kinds of uh, potential environmental or other effects of projects before they're actually carried out. So these potential effects can include environmental effects and that's very common, so the biophysical effects, but it can also include socioeconomic effects, effects on culture and language and health effects. And the purpose of an EIA is to anticipate those adverse effects and to either prevent or design mitigation measures to help reduce those adverse effects. Um, environmental impact assessment can also be called environmental assessment. For instance, in Nova Scotia, they're called environmental assessment, or they can be called an impact assessment, which is what they refer to federally. Um, and 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 there are some other uh, terms and processes that are not environmental impact assessment. So for example, <clears throat> environmental audits or environmental site assessments are not actually part of the environmental assessment process. So environmental impact assessment in Canada and in other places in the world generally follow a similar pattern or a similar process. 
So it starts with a project triggering environmental impact assessment. And by triggering, I mean there is a list or a regulation that states that certain types of projects have to go, undergo environmental impact assessment before they can go ahead. And that when a project triggers EIA, a proponent or a person that proposes a project, it can be a person, it can be a company, has to register their project. And by register, we mean providing information uh, about a project and providing it to an agency that um, <clears throat> discusses the project and its effects. There's an initial assessment often by an agency to determine whether more is necessary or whether the project can go ahead. Um, sometimes there are additional steps that have to be taken. So further studies, more information that's necessary before uh, a project can be determined can be determined whether it's good or not. And then a decision is made and often uh, approved. And when a, with an approval comes often lots of conditions, uh, which include mitigation measures. And then once the project is actually through the EIA process, there are still other permits and pro approvals uh, and things that are necessary for proponents to uh, receive. So for instance, there are still other permits and approvals provincially and federally that a person or a project uh, may require uh, before they can begin. Uh, just a note on um, federal and provincial jurisdiction and, we, and the reason why we have all kinds of different processes. So every province and territory has an environmental impact assessment process and there's a federal one and the reason for this is because of sections 91 and section 92 of the constitution act of 1867 which provide different responsibilities to federal and provincial governments over different subjects so for instance the federal government has authority and responsibility over things like shipping and fishing and the provincial government has responsibilities over things like uh, um, provincial crown lands, which can include activities like mining um, and forestry and local and civic um, rights and properties. Uh, and just another really important note while we're on the issue of the Constitution uh, is Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, which creates a constitutional duty for governments. So governments have this duty to consult with Indigenous peoples before engaging in activities uh, that could threaten their constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights. So this is a constitutional duty for governments. <clears throat> and uh, environmental impact assessments or impact assessment approvals issued by government triggers this duty to consult. And there's often a, a process to include consultation in environmental impact assessments. Um, and they're meant to get at this duty to consult, but they may not be sufficient to actually meet the constitutional duty to consult. And it's really um, uh, uh, site by site and project by project assessment. Um, so let's get right into federal impact assessment. So federal impact assessment is done under the Impact Assessment Act, which replaced the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act 2012 in August 2019. So from August 19 to now and into the future, uh, the Impact Assessment Act applies any projects that were begun before the Impact Assessment Act came into uh, force are still undergoing environmental assessment under SIA 2012. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the federal minister, is responsible for the act, all of the regulations under the act, and responsible for making final decisions. And then the Impact Agency of Canada, often referred to as the agency or IAC, is responsible for doing the kind of day-to-day -day impact assessment. And I just want to highlight a really um, important tool at the federal level, uh, and there's a, a similar one at the provincial level, which is the Impact Assessment Registry. And you can find this, you can go on the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada's website, or you can just do like I do and Google Impact Assessment Registry, and it's the first option. Um, this registry is really important because this is where all of the information about projects that are undergoing impact assessment go. It's where notices go. It's where participation opportunities go. And it's also where public submissions go. So if you're submitting on an impact assessment federally, your submission could end up on this registry. 
And if you see there on the left portion of this screen here, there's all kinds of different ways to refine your search and find information about different projects. So for example, here, I've noted that you can look up uh, projects that are ongoing in New Brunswick and there's 35. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. So generally under the Impact Assessment Act, there's five kind of phases, planning, impact statement, impact assessment, decision-making and post-decision. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about all these steps and we'll kind of walk you through how it all works. Um, but we start with uh, when an impact assessment is actually required. And as I mentioned, it's often the case that um, projects are listed and if they're listed, they require an impact assessment or environmental impact assessment. So under the physical activities regulations, which are created under the Impact Assessment Act, there's a schedule, and this schedule is very similar to the one that's found in New Brunswick. Um, and all of the projects listed in that schedule are required to undergo an environmental or in, an impact assessment. And I've highlighted here as an example, uh, one of the types of projects, so mines and metal mills that are found in the project list. So this is kind of what the project list looks like. And you can see that there's a header and then there's various types of projects, various kinds of mines that require an IA. Uh, the minister also has discretionary power to designate a project that's not listed in this, um, the, in the physical activities regulations. And this is a really, great opportunity for people to be involved because under the act, any person, any organization can actually request the minister to designate a project that's not on the list. So even if it's not required to undergo an impact assessment, you can uh, request that it be designated and the minister has 90 days to respond uh, and they have to respond with reasons. So they have to set out why or why not, uh, that why they designate or did not designate a project. Uh, and I've used this several times already with various organizations and individuals, and it can be a, an empowering tool. So once an environmental assessment is uh, required, the first thing that is done is a project description. So the proponent produces a project description that sets out the various details and information about the project, including what are its objectives, what are its benefits, uh, what's the location and other details around the project. And then a determination of impact assessment is made. So the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada reviews that project description. Uh, I can request more information from the proponent. Um, and then once it accepts that uh, project description, it has 80, 180 days to determine whether an IA is actually required. Um, I will note that during this 180 days, again, the public has an opportunity to participate. Um, and the agency has to uh, allow a 30 day period for review. Um, and this, this terminology of meaningfully engaging with the public is set out throughout the impact assessment act. Uh, and it's uh, really guided by this uh, definition, which uh, describes meaningful public in participation as uh, meaning that members of the public wishing to participate have the opportunity to do that that they're provided with information and the capacity to participate and that um, they do so in an informed way. So they have that information to make um, informed uh, submissions. And it also means that the public uh, input and the submissions and the commentary and feedback is, is actually informing decision-making at the end of the day. So, um, uh, the agency will also consult with a life cycle regulator, federal authorities who have experience, provinces and territories and indigenous jurisdictions and indigenous groups who may be impacted in the determination of whether an IA uh, is necessary or further steps are required. Uh, and then they'll create a summary of issues document that reflects the issues that were raised. Um, and then they'll provide that to, to the proponent who will then prepare a revised project description that. Uh, is meant to address the concerns that are raised. And some of the things that uh, are set out in the Impact Assessment Act are, are factors that actually uh, 
are meant to be considered as part of this process. And I'll talk a little bit about these again, but some of the things are changes to the environment, health, social or economic conditions, uh, mitigation measures, alternatives, indigenous knowledge, community knowledge and public comment, um, and, um, and, and some of these other factors. So they're really important. And it really is, um, I think, a step for a step away from what environmental assessments used to be federally towards a more comprehensive and broad review of all of the different kinds of impacts that could be felt by a project. So one of the options as a result of that process is that an IA is not required. Um, and so at that point, the project is finished with this process and then it would move on to receiving any of the other kinds of permits and uh, approvals that would be necessary under legislation. Or uh, a further uh, impact assessment is necessary. In that case, a notice of commencement is issued um, and posted on the registry by the agency. And along with that notice of commencement, the agency also creates a public participation plan and tailored impact statement guidelines. And so the public participation plan is really meant to set out how the public will be engaged throughout the impact assessment process. And this is a really uh, key new step in the Impact Assessment Act. And so a participation plan will introduce and summarize what the project is, what the objectives of the participation plan are, It'll provide some and set out some of the tools that might be used to, to help the public participate. It'll provide an outline of those activities and training and approaches that might be used. It'll set out ways people can access funding. So there's funding available through the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada and provide other kinds of information and contact information. Additionally, there's also an opportunity for the public to participate. Um, because the public has the right to um, provide written um, comments on the statement guidelines. And so the, the tailored impact statement guidelines basically serve as a reference for the proponent um, to do the studies that they're going to have to do as part of the impact ass assessment. Now, an impact assessment that is continuing under this process can go kind of two ways. It can be reviewed by the agency, or it can be done by an impact assessment panel, or sometimes uh, an integrated impact assessment panel. I'll talk a little bit about what those are. Um, but basically, once a notice of commencement has been issued, the minister has 45 days to determine if it's in the public interest to refer the project to a review panel or to remain or to keep the project with the agency. And so we move on to the next step, which is an impact statement. Um, and so the proponent has three years to develop and submit an impact statement to the agency uh, or to a review panel. Um, and this is guided by tailored impact statement guidelines. So these are the statements that um, you have, the public has a chance to comment on and that really set out the scope and breadth of what the impact assessment will look like. Um, and once the impact statement is complete and has been accepted by the agency, then we the work shifts to the agency or to the review panel to do the next kind of steps, including the engagement, uh, producing a report, and potentially having uh, hosting public hearings. So if an impact assessment stays with the agency, the agency reviews the impact statement that the pro proponent produces. And the impact statement is really all of the studies, all of the information that the proponent has uh, completed. And the agency ensures that it complies with the guidelines. So the agency will have provided certain things that the proponent has to cover, and they'll make sure that the impact statement, all of the studies uh, comply with all those conditions. So they've met all of those things that they had to look at. And then it has 30 days to prepare, an, or 300 days, I apologize, to prepare an impact assessment report, which will then serve as basically a recommendation to the minister. Uh, during this 300 days, the agency has to provide the public um, with an opportunity to comment on a draft impact assessment report. And so the draft is posted on the registry and there's opportunity for written submissions. If, on the other hand, the impact assessment uh, 
goes to a review panel. So if the minister within 45 days has determined that a review panel is in the public interest, then the minister has 45 more days to establish a terms of reference. So this helps guide what the review panel will do. And then the agency will actually appoint members who are unbiased um, and have relevant experience uh, for that project. The agency will then, once the proponent creates the impact of statement, the agency will review it to make sure it complies with the guidelines, but the panel will actually look at that impact statement and determine if the, the concerns that are meant to be addressed have actually been addressed. A public uh, opportunity here as well, because the review panel will hold a public, a public hearings and members of the public can make their uh, concerns known, present evidence uh, and provide comments. And then the panel will have 600 days, so almost two years to provide its findings, which again will serve as a recommendation to the minister. And just a note on life cycle regulators, uh, if a project's activities fall under the authority of a life cycle regulator, and the life cycle regulators currently are the Canada Energy Regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and the Offshore Petroleum Boards, if the project's activity fall under the authority of one of those regulators, then the impact assessment must go through an integrated review panel, which is really similar to a review panel, but a member of that life cycle regulator agency will actually sit on that panel. Um, and will help inform the um, terms of reference for the proponent. So they'll help provide input into what the proponent will have to undertake. And then once the uh, rec recommendation is complete, so the, the, the agency's report or the panel's report, um, it goes to a decision-making phase, so the, fa the fourth phase of the process. And so the federal minister, if it was an agency review or the governor and council, if it was a panel review, will decide whether a proposed project's anticipated effects are in the public interest, considering all of the factors uh, that I mentioned earlier. So considering whether the project will contribute to sustainability, whether there are significant adverse effects and whether they can be mitigated, what are the impacts on the rights of indigenous peoples or to what extent would a project hinder or contribute to Canada's ability to meet environmental obligations and climate change commitments. And if it is in the public interest, despite the adverse effect, it may go forward. Uh, and um, then we get to the fifth phase, which essentially uh, is when the minister will post a decision statement. So the decision statement will, um, set out all of the mitigation measures, conditions, follow-up programs, and reasons justifying the minister's decision uh, for approving the, the project or not approving the project. Um, and then after that, the agency is responsible for compliance uh, and they issue compliance reports. Um, and in the case of um, as life cycle regulators, the life cycle regulators will be responsible for compliance, ensuring compliance. Um, the conditions for a decision statement cannot be changed um, without public input. So there is a commentary period if the, the minister decides to change the conditions of a project, but the conditions for a project can't be changed if it's under the authority of a Canada Nuclear Safety Commission. And I just want to highlight very briefly some other processes that are also available under the Impact Assessment Act. And one of our guest speakers will be speaking a little bit more about regional assessment and strategic assessment. But in a nutshell, there's these two other processes, there's three other processes, but regional assessment and strategic assessment. Uh, regional assessment is an assessment of a defined region or a study area, as it's sometimes called, uh, that's focused on determining the effects of current and future activities within an entire region, including and with emphasizing cumulative impacts, uh, which is meant to help inform project specific uh, impact assessment. <clears throat> and there has been one completed regional assessment so far on the offshore of Newfoundland, and it was related to exploratory oil and gas drilling. There's also another regional assessment uh, in its very early stages in the Ring of Fire, 
um, and which is an, a region north in the northern part of Ontario. Uh, and then strategic assessment is similar, but it is an assessment of the effects of government policies or guidance on impact assessments. Um, and there has been one strategic assessment in Canada as well, strategic assessment of climate change, uh, sometimes called SAC. Um, and these two processes are similar to impact assessment in the sense that uh, the public actually has opportunities to request a regional assessment and to request a strategic assessment. So there are actually specific provisions that allow folks to uh, request these and then the minister has to respond with reasons uh, whether or not they designate uh, regional assessment or strategic assessment. And then there are projects carried out on federal lands. And when I mentioned earlier in the impact assessment registry that there are 35 um, uh, um, projects currently in the registry for New Brunswick, all of those projects currently are actually projects carried out on federal lands. So that means that they, they're not actually projects that require an impact assessment that has to go through the process I've just described, but rather they're something more akin to an internal review when an authority, so like a government department, so for instance, the, the Transport Canada or Department of Fisheries and Oceans decides to do a project uh, that's on federal lands, they have to review the potential impact of that project before carrying it out. And as part of that process, they actually take all their findings um, and they'll post them on the registry and the public has a 30 day comment period where they can actually provide submissions on that process. So that's pretty much it for federal impact assessment for today. Uh, so I'll just move into um, provincial imp environmental impact assessment. Um, so in New Brunswick, Environmental impact assessment is governed by the environmental impact assessment regulations, uh, which are created under the Clean Environment Act. Um, similar to the federal process, the Minister of Environment and Local Government in New Brunswick is responsible for the act and the regulations, as well as for making final decisions, but the environmental impact assessment branch is responsible for carrying out environmental impact assessments in the province. And so this is just a diagram again, showing kind of how environmental impact assessments in New Brunswick are carried out. So similar to other processes, again, uh, uh, if when a project is proposed, it can trigger an environmental impact assessment uh, under schedule A of the regulations. And all projects that are caught by the schedule are required to produce a registration document. Uh, so I've, I've highlighted some examples from <clears throat> Schedule A, which lists fully all of the projects that require an EIA. And I've highlighted these because I find them interesting in comparison to the federal um, project list, because some of these are actually pretty broad and encompassing. And there's potential, I see some potential here for projects to be um, assessed um, that uh, might not otherwise be assessed. So, so for instance, uh, section L, uh, all projects or all programs or commercial ventures involving introduction uh, into New Brunswick of species that are not indigenous to the province. And the first thing that came to my mind in this, for this example is aquaculture. So if you introduce uh, species into the, the water that's not native to uh, New Brunswick, that, that would require an environmental impact assessment. So it's kind of a, a, a unique way of potentially capturing aquaculture, uh, something that's not otherwise necessarily captured. And so, for instance, in uh, Nova Scotia, aquaculture is actually not captured by environmental impact assessments at all. Uh, so uh, Section P, all major recreational and tourism developments, including those that are consisting of a land change, to be used for recreation and tourism. And again, the first thing that came to mind is golf courses uh, or similar types of uh, developments, which again, in other places are not necessarily assessed. So you could actually envision a golf course going through an environmental impact assessment, which I thought was really unique. Uh, and then some of these other, uh, I, I guess I'll talk just quickly about uh, section U, subsection U, uh, all enterprises, activities, et cetera, that affect unique, rare, or endangered features of the environment. And so this potentially could 
um, apply to any project if there are unique and rare or endangered species or species at risk um, that are impacted by that project. Um, it's, I'm not actually certain, but this could actually potentially even apply to federal species at risk or migratory birds. So there's a, a great deal of breadth here in terms of the potential implications of uh, projects and their, their need to undergo environmental impact assessment under this um, provision. And then another really important one I think is um, um, projects that affect uh, two or more hectares of wetland. That's a really important one because it can capture a whole host of projects that might have really devastating impacts on the environment. So as I said, um, any of the projects that are captured by the Schedule A are required to be registered. So the proponent actually produces a registration document, provides that to the EIA branch. Uh, the regulations set out the kinds of information that are necessary by the, to, for the proponent to provide. So things like the local, uh, the locale, the location and the size, associated activities with a project. So for instance, if you have a mine, uh, they would need to include information about potentially transporting ore or other kinds of activities. Uh, they have to provide information about the current environmental conditions. So for instance, are there spe are rare species, species at risk, rare plants, water courses, et cetera. Um, the potential environmental impacts or effects of the project and then potential mitigation uh, measures that could be applied. A copy of the registration document is posted on the department's uh, registry for people to see. And I will mention that there are actually two registries. So there's one for determination reviews, and then there's one specifically for comprehensive reviews. And I'll talk about both of those uh, now. So a determination review is uh, the most common and all projects will undergo this, this step. Um, excuse me. <coughs> and this stage of the environmental impact assessment is focused on assessing environmental impacts generally and identifying potential mitigation measures. This stage is administered by the by a project manager at the um, EIA branch, who also receives advice from a technical review committee. And that committee is made out of um, project specific experts from government agencies uh, and departments at the provincial, federal and municipal levels. Um, and Typically, it's very typical for the technical review committee to actually require the proponent to produce additional information before they accept the, uh, the registration document. As part of this process, uh, there is potential for, for the public to participate and be involved. So the, the regulations actually require the proponent to consult with the public and to prepare a summary containing their responses uh, to the concerns that were raised by the public. And this is all necessary documentation as part of the registration document in order for the determination review, that first stage of the EIA process to be completed. It's usually pretty typical for proponents to do this consultation uh, before submitting their registration document, but it's not necessarily necessary. Um, and typically consultation takes the form of um, open houses or presentations. Uh, and just one final note, I guess, to the proponents out there, um, it is advised that the proponents inform the EIA branch that there are consultation opportunities, because if they get into a situation where the public is not notified, that may end up requiring additional consultation on the proponent's behalf. So after a determination review process is completed, the proponent has provided registration document. All of the information has been provided that is necessary. Um, the public has been consulted. And there's basically three options, approval, denial, or a comprehensive environmental impact assessment. So in the case of an undertake, undertaking proceeding, so it receives approval, which is uh, the common, uh, almost always what happens, uh, the, the project will be allowed to go ahead, but it will almost always have certain conditions and mitigations and terms and conditions that it will, it will need to follow. 
Uh, and then, of course, there's also still all of the other pieces of legislation that are applicable. So even if you've gone through an EIA and you've been approved through the determination review, the proponent will still be required for, to undergo all of the other um, approval processes and permitting and licensing under other statutes, under other laws. Um, the project can also result in a denial. And what happens here is the minister will actually take it to the Lieutenant Governor and Council who will then provide um, assent for that proposal uh, being denied. Or the final, uh, in the final case, a comprehensive environmental impact assessment can be required. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, comprehensive environmental impact assessments just briefly. Um, I will note that there's currently only one project undergoing envir uh, comprehensive environmental impact assessment and that is the Sissons Mine project. So under this process, uh, the next step is for the technical review committee to draft guidelines similar to the, the way the provincial, the federal process works. Um, and the guidelines will um, essentially guide the proponent in all the, the things that it needs to do and identify and study. Uh, and there is a public participation opportunity at this point because there is a, th a required 30-day public commentary period for people to provide written comments about the draft guidelines. So in that case, the public actually has an opportunity to guide the scope and guide the types of things that will be covered by the comprehensive environmental impact assessment. Once the guidelines are finalized, once the public input has been provided, um, the proponent will then provide the minister with their terms of reference. So the guidelines are meant to set out all the kinds of things that need to be studied and capture the information that has to be included. And the proponent produces terms of reference that actually shows how the proponent intends to respond, how to how intends to produce that information, the kinds of studies it'll do. Um, and at this point, again, the public could be consulted. The proponent has the opportunity to seek public input, but that is not required. And then we move to the uh, in environmental impact assessment report process. So the proponent will produce a draft EIA report. So setting out all of the conclusions, all of the results of its studies. Um, and it'll provide it to the technical review committee, which will look at that report and it'll either accept it if it complies with the guidelines. So it's addressed all the terms and conditions and things that the proponent needed to do, or it'll send it back to the proponent with revisions potentially for further studies. Once the environmental impact assessment report is completed and accepted, it's met all of the conditions of the guidelines, then the minister will make a copy of that report. They'll also summarize all the information in the report and they'll make that available to the public on the registry for another 30 day public commentary period. And then we have public meetings. So once the minister has done that, has posted that um, environmental impact assessment report for the public and for public comments, uh, they will begin to provide information about uh, at least one public meeting, which must be conducted near the location of where the pro proposed project will be taking place. Uh, the, the public meetings are led by the department and there's opportunities for independent experts to also um, chair that meeting. And really these public meetings are an opportunity, again, for the public, stakeholders, people who have concerns, to make comments, to raise concerns, and to ask questions about the project and the EIS report. After that, the public meeting or the public meetings, depending if there's more than one, uh, are finished, then there's another 15-day public commentary period, which allows additional uh, written submissions to be made. And then the minister repairs the report for the uh, governor uh, in council. And uh, that will result in a proposal denial or proposal approval. And again, in the case of an approval, uh, there's often many conditions and terms, uh, as well as mitigation measures that have to be um, adhered to by the proponent. 
And just a few other points before I turn it over to the guest speakers here. There is quite a bit of interaction between the federal impact assessment and the provincial environmental impact assessment. And that's partially because of what I described earlier in terms of the shared jurisdiction, sometimes overlap of jurisdiction or projects um, having components of federal and provincial jurisdiction. The Impact Assessment Agency of Canada does offer to cooperate with any province, including New Brunswick, um, where that jurisdiction actually has powers or responsibilities related to the project. And so they can, so the, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada sometimes will delegate a part of impact assessment to a province. And sometimes it can also substitute a provincial impact assessment or environmental impact assessment for a part of the process of an environment an impact assessment federally. Um, if it if the if the impact assessment agency of Canada decides to substitute a provincial IA process for a federal IA process or part of a federal IA process, then there's another comment period here. So the public actually has to have an opportunity to comment on that proposed substitution. That's what it's called, substitution. In terms of funding, and I, I know lots of people are always um, worried about funding and, and, and taking the time to uh, be involved. As far as I know, there's no provincial funding available to participate in an impact, environmental impact assessment in New Brunswick. But there is federal participant funding available through the participant funding program that's offered by the agency. And um, typically on the registry when an um, impact assessment is being done or a regional assessment or strategic assessment, um, the agency will post a notice of um, a public um, participant funding program application period. And all folks who have some sort of interest in that assessment process can apply and potentially receive some funding to help them participate. And then finally, a question that I get asked quite frequently, uh, how do I challenge a decision that's been made under an impact assessment or an environmental impact assessment process? So under the federal process, there is no right of appeal. And under the provincial process, only proponents have a right of appeal. So the only way for, for the general public, for non-proponents uh, to review a decision made under one of these processes is a judicial review. I'm not gonna get into all the specifics of what that would entail, because that, could, that could be a whole other webinar. Uh, but basically a judicial review is um, uh, a proceeding where you request the court to examine the conduct or the decision of an administrative decision maker. So in this case, one of the ministers or perhaps a review panel um, to ensure that that conduct or that decision was proper in law. Um, there's all kinds of complexities to a judicial review, um, so I'm not going to get into those here, but I would advise if someone is considering a judicial review of an impact assessment or an environmental impact assessment to get some help and assistance from a lawyer. That is the end of my presentation.